questions? Please. Okay. You, and you'll let me know when we can wrap up. We should wrap up. Okay, comments and questions? Yeah. Um, you said 10, okay. Um, I thought you said 10,000 gallons of chemicals are poured into each well. That's right. And did you say 49 million Four, gallons of 429 million. 429, okay, 429. thank you. Yeah. That's in chapter 10 of Raising Elijah, if you, if you want more of that data. Yes. Um, first of all, I want to thank you very much for, for all that you do. Um, but I did have a, a specific question. And that is that the geology in our area is very different than, say, in Texas. And I've heard in, <laughs> that the amount of the fracking fluid that comes back in our region is a lot less than in Texas, for example. So I'm wondering if uh, the injection of fluid at such high pressure in our region results in that fluid coming through the layers of rock, through fissures and so on, and actually having a, a faster cycle time than we think and possibly uh, contaminating our aquifers even sooner than, than maybe predicted? That's a really good question. So for those of you who might not have heard it, let me repeat it. So uh, it is true, um, the first half of what you said, that the fraction of the water and chemicals that go into a well, right, there's some 40 to 70 percent comes back. That's a really variable number because in Texas that, that's a very, the, the amount that comes back and the amount that stays in is much different than it is here. So the fact that in here we get less back um, does that mean that there are more fractures and fissures that it can find its way into? Um, I don't, as far as I know, we don't have an answer to that. I mean, the, there's so many unknowns about the geology of this. And uh, having befriended uh, Tony and Graffia from Cornell University over this last year, I, I direct all my questions like that to him. Tony and Graffia is probably one of the three world's experts on fracturing in deep shale formations. That's just what he does. And I guess. He doesn't like to be called a geologist, he likes to be called a geological engineer, um, but he certainly knows a lot of geology. Uh, and so I'm surprised at how many of my questions to him come back that we, we just don't know, know the answer. So uh, although I don't know the answer to that, there is one risk that um, I think you'll hear more about from Ron Bishop when he speaks, um, and that is all of the abandoned gas wells that we already have um, that are like little cocktail straws that stick down into the Marcellus. So, you know that natural gas drilling was invented here in New York in something like 1849. So we've been at it for a long time, um, these vertical wells. And so there are thousands of vertical wells that either hit, uh, a, were dry, right, or that tapped out all the reserves and now are abandoned. Those are entirely unmapped. Um, so we don't know where they are, and a lot of them have never been filled with cement or anything. So uh, although the gas companies will tell you that um, the, the shale layers over top of the Marcellus form an impermeable lid, um, what they don't mention is that that lid has already been breached by all of like, these kind of uh, voodoo doll-like uh, gas wells that form connections between down there and up here. So. That's a known hazard, and that is actually keeps me awake at night thinking about that. Uh, then you ra raise the possibility that, that there are naturally occurring fissures. Um, that I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows. Um, the gas company says they do, and they might be right, that, that, that there are none, um, but I don't know. Uh, we, we know, for example, that there's a, a state park near here, Salt Springs State Park in Pennsylvania, where water comes from below the Marcellus and bring salt with it to the surface. And so there are natural processes, I think, in this, in this area yeah, that, maybe um, I don't, that, that I don't bring water right. from, from those yeah. great depths. And the other factor is, of course, that we have radon here. Yeah. And that comes from, from certainly that depth as well. Right, yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of things to think about. And as far as I know, there are no good answers. One of them is um, when we... Um, what, well, let me say this. Say it this way. There's another difference between uh, Texas and uh, our area, which is that we don't have the kind of geology that allows for deep well injection. So when the, all that poisonous frac fluid comes back up, uh, 40 to 70 percent of four to nine million gallons is still a whole lot of stuff, and now it's really poisonous, and it has to be disposed of. 
There is no technology that we've ever invented that can turn that poisonous frac fluid back to drinkable water. We know that, right? You can't filter radioactivity. That's the lesson of Japan. Um, uh, so where are we going to put that? So out west, they actually uh, inject it under high pressure back down into the earth uh, in these uh, deep well injections, so for better or for worse, right? But we, we don't have that option here in the east. And so uh, up to very recently in Pennsylvania, um, we, we've simply taken that frac fluid into sewage treatment plants um, and run it through uh, sewage treatment. And we know that not all of uh, uh, not all of that, the stuff that's in there can be filtered out uh, because it's ended up, at, uh, in, for example, near uh, Pittsburgh uh, in uh, people's drinking water to the point where they couldn't, couldn't drink it anymore because it had so um, much, some certain, certain heavy metals in it. Um, so, you know, what is it that we are going to do with it? It seems to me a kind of unresolved, uh, an unresolved problem. According to the uh, gas industry representatives I heard testify in Albany at the hearings uh, last week, uh, they recognize that kind of open pits are, are not um, good because they allow the evaporation of a lot of the volatile toxics. Um, so they're talking about uh, perfect containment um, and as well creating setbacks. Uh, so I think it's important to uh, ask ourselves um, if that is sufficient for us because it would mean turning vast acreage of upstate New York into no man's lands where we would permanently um, store hazardous stuff and all these wells would be set back, you know, we can argue about how much, 150 feet, 350 feet, but that would mean for every well and for all the stuff that comes back, um, a ring of a no, no trespassing zone would have to uh, go around and if you do the math, um, a circle that's uh, with a radius of 150 feet is a couple of acres. Uh, 77,000 wells are planned. Even if the, some of those wells are all on the same pad, you end up with an um, amount of, that's hundreds of square miles of, la of land that would never be able to develop for real estate, never be able to be used for recreation. Nobody could build on it. Nobody could go there and so forth. And so is that, uh, how does that affect our tax base? I mean, these are all kind of unanswered uh, uh, questions, um, I think. So the disposal of the frac fluid is something important, which reminds me that frac, uh, something that frac action, a very good group I've worked with before, wants me to let you know um, that there is in fact um, a, a letter to Governor Cuomo that would could use your signature, um, which uh, would ask for um, a permanent ban on hydrofracking for oil and gas in New York State but also for labeling that poisonous flowback fluid hazardous waste. Um, so it would have to be disposed of as hazardous waste. And you know, any other kind of hazardous waste couldn't just go into the sewage treatment plant uh, downstream of which people draw their drinking water. So, uh, so take a look at the table right outside uh, the, uh, the room here and um, see if you can add your voice to um, at least getting the stuff labeled for what it is. Uh, I guess you can't answer this question either. Do we have any idea what the fluids that are used are that are injected to, to do the fracking? We do and we don't. Um, the, because right now fracking is exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act, in that act um, is, is part of the, our right to know law, right? And that would require um, a d disclosure of all chemicals that are uh, released into the ground, for example. Um, but because of that exemption, um, the companies are not required to disclose what their secret formula is. So we don't know for any individual well what's going into it, um, which creates a problem for a sewage treatment plant because then they, they don't know what they're, being, what they're receiving and how to, how to deal with it. Um, on the other hand, we do have a kind of master list of all the chemicals that frackers have available to them to use. And probably the best uh, place to go for a description of that list is uh, the, the Endocrine Disruptor Exchange in Colorado, which is kind of the, uh, the standard bearer for understanding um, what the chemicals that are used in fracking really are. And the website for all that is in the back of my own book, Raising Elijah. Um, so they have uh, compiled a list of about four or five hundred different chemicals that we know are used in fracking. That's not to say that four to five hundred chemicals are used in any individual well. Usually the frackers are going to choose from about a half a dozen or so of those chemicals. 
Um, another uncertainty is introduced because nobody knows, not even the oil and gas industry, what's in the flowback fluid because it contains all of the elements that are down there naturally under the ground, and those vary from place to place. So in one place you can have a lot of benzene, someplace else you might not have any. Some place might have a lot of arsenic, a lot of brine, a lot of barium, and so forth. So um, nobody's testing for what comes back out of the water. Can, excuse me. Hi, Sandra. I just wanted to say that we do have a DVD uh, that's put out uh, by the Endocrine Disruption Exchange oh, okay. at the New York Residents Against Drilling table. Theo Colburn is the director there, and you can look for her DVD there. Okay. Somebody over here has a comment. I wanted to ask you about seismic activity. I understand when I first asked Engrafia about it, he said that wasn't the biggest concern, but there's been an increase, I think, in Arkansas and some other places. If you could comment a little bit about okay. that. Yep. And so there's a concern, can, can fracking cause earthquakes? And uh, in, in Arkansas, there is a kind of a cluster of low-level earthquakes associated with fracking activity, but it's important to point out that that was from the deep well injection of the waste, not from fracking itself. On the other hand, more recently in England, um, which did start fracking, um, very recently two small earthquakes were associated with fracking. Um, and so, uh, therefore, that activity has been halted until they can figure it out. We're not really in a seismically active area here. That's not among my biggest concerns um, about um, what will happen here. Um, my biggest concerns are the vulnerability of our, our water, um, which is uh, my, my aquifer, this sort of what's called un, um, the aquifer that doesn't have the lid over the top, the unconsolidated aquifer, is the kind of aquifers that most of us have. They're, very vulnerable to contamination, not necessarily from underneath, but from any spills that happen on, on top of the uh, surface, which with fracking um, seems to happen very frequently and are not, you know, you can, through best practices, avoid maybe a lot of them, but you can't avoid them all. And all it takes is one to permanently contaminate an aquifer. Um, so that, that's my biggest concern, that and the air pollution issue. Um, I talked a lot about air pollution in Vesto last month. I didn't hit on it here um, because we're at a water festival, um, but the air issues are at least as important as the water issues. With uh, 1,000 tanker trucks trips required for every well, this will fill our, our rural back roads with fleets of 18-wheelers haul hauling hazmat and putting diesel exhaust into the air. Um, all the compressors and the condensers also run on diesel. Um, so almost certainly we'll be blanketed with smog. Mm -hmm.